Now the two things that Jesus demonstrated so unequivocally for us are relinquishment and acceptance when he went to the cross. He gave up all rights when he came into this world as a helpless baby and he relinquished all to the Father. And he prayed in Gethsemane, not my will, but thine be done. And that should be the note of our lives, similar to that of Mary, when Mary received that visitor telling her that she was to be the mother of the Son of God. Mary's response was an instant one of total relinquishment of her own plans. How could she possibly imagine trying to explain to Joseph that she had not been unfaithful to him? And as you recall in the story, Joseph did believe that she had been unfaithful because the Bible says that he, being a righteous man, was going to put her away privately because, of course, in Jewish law, he could not marry a fornicator. How would she explain to the people in the town? How would she explain to her parents her pregnancy? But we find not a word of self-defense on Mary's part. God took care of explaining to Joseph. He sent an angel to make that clear. But Mary relinquished her plans. You can imagine, we can, try to, we can only try to imagine the shock of having that kind of a visitor and that kind of an announcement. But she opened her hands, and that should be our attitude through all of life toward Christ. Open hands, letting go of what God wants to take and receiving what God wants to give. And we cannot receive what he wants to give until we have let go of what he wants to take. So relinquishment and acceptance are the great principles of the cross. Now look at the demands of the Incarnation. He put himself in a position where he was hungry, he was weary, he was thirsty, he never owned a home, he was an itinerant rabbi in the only three years that we know very much about. We can only assume that he must have worked hard in the carpenter shop with his foster father, Joseph. And I think that when he says, I do the works that I see my father do, he was, of course, referring to his heavenly father. But as a little boy, he had to learn from Joseph how to use tools, the hammer and the saw and the adze. And Jesus probably said just what a little, any little boy says when he's trying to learn something from his dad. Is this right, Dad? Is this the way I hold it? Is this what I do? And his father corrects and corrects and corrects. And Jesus was a little boy, a little helpless boy to start with. He was not omnipotent. The Bible says he could not do many mighty works in certain places because of their unbelief. It's staggering, isn't it, to think that the one who created the heavens and the stars was helpless because of the lack of faith on the part of the people to whom he spoke. Now, I just want to give you just an inkling of his power. When the Bible says he made the stars, talk about a laconic understatement, and he made the stars as if it was just sort of you know, about as simple as scrambling some eggs or baking a cake. Well, I just learned a few years, a couple of years ago, about one star. It's in the constellation of Scorpio, which can be seen low on the summer horizon. It's a pinkish, super giant star. 390 times the size of the sun. And the sun, some of you know, is one and a quarter million times the size of the earth. Can you comprehend that? I'm lost when I get past a million. A million and a quarter is a bit much. Um, This star 
is 390 times the size of the sun, which is one and a quarter million times the size of the earth. So some of you can do that in your head, how big that star is. (laughs) But if you take a hollow rubber ball, cut it in half, and let that ball represent this star called Antares, then you can put inside the ball Venus, Mercury, and Mars, and the earth, and the sun. And Venus and Mercury and Mars and the Earth will continue their orbits around the sun without touching the inside of that rubber ball. That's the size of one star. One star. And when I heard a Scottish preacher tell this, this is where I learned it from a tape, and he ended this staggering bit of news, this incomprehensible, tremendous size. He said, they are pebbles on the shores of the great ocean of space and time where light swims through a billion years from island universe to island universe. And of all that stellar magnitude, the Bible says in beautiful understatement, he made the stars also. They are the work of his fingers. And those tiny little hands were helpless and ultimately were nailed immobile for you and me. Relinquishment, acceptance of the will of his father Look at Jesus, first of all. He never performed a miracle to lift the constraints of his own humanity. What was Satan's temptation to him in the wilderness? Jesus had been fasting for 40 days. He was very hungry. And Satan came to him him and took advantage instantly of that moment of weakness and suggested that Why not command the stones to be made bread? Plenty of stones around. And Jesus never once performed a miracle for his own good to lift the constraints of his humanity. Nobody else can turn stones into bread. Now, he did miracles. He turned water into wine, but it wasn't for himself. He never did it for himself. He never broke the hardness of his listeners' hearts. He could have, couldn't he, if he was God, but he had accepted, he had totally accepted from his father's hand his will that he should be a human being, a man, living in a man's body, a Jewish body, for 33 years, walking here on earth, getting his feet dusty, becoming so tired he had to sit down by the well thirsty on the cross. His own disciples did not know what he was talking about. They did not understand. He lived, as someone has said, his chains to the terrible end. He lived his chains to the terrible end. Now, I can't see anybody here at the moment that's handicapped, but I'm sure there must be somebody. I see a couple of walkers So somebody around here has a little trouble with walking without some help. And I'm sure that there are a number of people with many different kinds of handicaps. You would love to get rid of those chains of constraint, wouldn't you? My husband has glaucoma. And glaucoma invariably and predictably leads to blindness. Unless you take drops. Now, they can't ever guarantee that you take the drops regularly and faithfully that you never will go blind, but you certainly can ward it off for a while. Ten times a day, my husband has to take drops. That's a constraint. And ten times a day, he has to keep his eyes closed for five minutes and hold his tear ducts like this for five minutes, 50 minutes a day. Well, that's as he would say, um, I can imagine afterwards, he's going to say, well, now, why did you have to mention that? You know, <laughs> That's nothing. He never makes a fuss about it. 
always thanking God that he can still see and just makes nothing of it. I mean, time after time, we, we've just seated ourselves in a restaurant and just when the waitress comes, there's my husband sitting like this. <laughs> the stewardess said on the plane yesterday, well, you were in profound meditation, so I decided not to bother. <laughs> well, you can't be explaining to everybody all the time everything, can you? But it's just a little thing. I don't know what your chains may be. Maybe they're emotional. Maybe they're mental. Maybe they're spiritual. Maybe they're physical. Maybe they're all of the above. Have you ever accepted what cannot be changed? It cannot be changed. There are a whole lot of things in our lives that cannot be changed. The woman whose letter I read to you this morning could not change her husband. And God knew she had tried. And I suppose that every one of us who's ever had a husband could think of one or two tiny suggestions that we might make which would make them the perfect husband that we thought we were getting. And I have been married to three very, very different men. Very different. Now, to put your minds at ease, the first two are in heaven. I've not been divorced ever, but God has given me tests in learning to be submissive to three very, very different kinds of men. These are the circumstances in which God has put me. Relinquishment means no to myself. Acceptance means yes to God. Yes, Lord, I'll take it. I used to think it was a terrible cross to bear that I was as tall as I am when I was 12 years old. Now, most girls do stop growing when they're 12 years old, but when you're 5 feet 9 and 12 years old and all the boys are about up to here in the 8th grade, it's extremely embarrassing, and I used to think that was a great handicap. Well... I've long since learned to thank God for the circumstances. Now, there are many things in our lives which we cannot change. You had nothing to do with the date of your birth, which means you have absolutely nothing to do with the fact that you are old now. (laughs) Some of you. I'd like to ask you, when does middle age begin? Well, the Bible says that a normal lifespan is 70 years, so middle age is 35. You didn't want to hear that, did you? (laughs) And after that, you're old. For the life of me, I cannot understand Christian women who hate that thought. Why? It was God's idea. It wasn't yours. In a beautiful hymn by Joseph Addison, there's a stanza that says, Through every period of my life, Thy goodness I'll pursue, and after death in distant worlds the glorious theme renew. Now, this period of my life, I am not only old, but people, some people would say I'm elderly. I am not getting older any more than anybody else. Your three-month-old baby is getting older at the same rate that I am. So we are all getting older. But what is it I just heard that's politically correct that we've been saying wrong? Um, Oh, yes, they've changed the name of the retirement home. It's not for old people anymore. It's for older people. Or for, it's not aged, but aging. Well, I'm aged, and I'm old, and I thank God for this. But it's one of the circumstances of my life that I had no choice about. I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. I didn't have anything to do with my parents, who they were, what color I was going to be, what height I was going to be, what my handicaps might turn out to be. My brains, my temperament, my idiosyncrasies, my peculiarities, my personality, these are God's assignment. And one of my life verses is Psalm 16:5. Lord, you have assigned me my portion and my cup and have made my lot secure. I can't tell you what peace that gives me. Everything is assigned, apportioned, bestowed, given. Now, if I am going to make that an offering back to Jesus Christ with thanksgiving, what do I have to do first? I cannot offer my old age until I have accepted it and received it with both hands and said, yes, Lord, I'll take it. And now I will offer it back to you with thanksgiving. 
And so it's a, it's a continuous cycle. My life is an offering. I relinquish my right to myself. My hands are open as I relinquish. I receive what God wants to give me. And so my life becomes praise every minute of every day. Some of my work is house cleaning. Some of it is cooking. Some of it is speaking. Some of it is preparing radio talks. Some of it is writing books. Do you think God's more impressed when I'm sitting at the computer writing a book than he is when I'm making applesauce? I don't think so. Because making applesauce happens to be the thing he wants me to do at that moment. And so the circumstances of my life dictate certain things. I have a husband, and so I have certain obligations and duties to him, which I say, yes, Lord, about. When I was first widowed, it was the last thing in the world that I wanted. I can't imagine anybody wanting the gift of widowhood. But God taught me that it was a gift. Jim and I had been in love for five and a half years before God brought us together. We had 27 months of marriage. So I was a widow. I'd had the gift of singleness to begin with, and I'd had the wonderful gift that I'd always longed for, which was marriage. And then God gave me the unspeakable gift of motherhood, and then I became a widow. Yes, Lord, in acceptance lieth peace. A poem by Amy Carmichael. In acceptance lieth peace. I couldn't change the fact that I was a widow. Jim was not coming back. I could be resentful. I could hate God. I could shake my fist in his face and tell him, I'm not going to trust you anymore. Or I could lose my life and say, yes, Lord. And through that, I find it. And I know peace and joy and freedom. I don't know what you may be chafing about in your circumstances that you know you can't change. Ladies, you cannot change your husband. You might as well quit trying. Except by prayer and possibly by a gentle and quiet spirit. You might. But the chances are God doesn't want to change him the way you want him to be changed. God might be working on you to change some things. Now, some of you don't have a husband and you're a little tired of hearing about all this. And some of you are very glad you don't have a husband. You used to have one. <laughs> but there are some of you who are eating your hearts out because you've never had one, and it doesn't look as though you're ever going to get one. And I'm very serious when I say this is where the cross cuts deeply into our hearts. My heart goes out to the hundreds of beautiful young Christian women that my husband and I meet everywhere we go. Where are the godly Christian men? We'd all like to know the answer to that one. But singleness is something to be accepted. Yes, Lord. It's none of my business whether next Wednesday he's going to bring along the man of my dreams. That's not my business. Only today is my business. Sometimes people say to me, well, how do I know if I have the gift of singleness? Well, I say... What day is this? Well, it's Friday. Okay, are you single today? Yes. <laughs> you have the gift of singleness. <laughs> Only God knows if it's a permanent gift. You don't have to ask him that. He'll show you. I certainly thought that my widowhood was a permanent gift. I never imagined getting a second husband. I thought it was a miracle I got the first one. So when the second one came along 13 years later, I thought, well, I'll probably be widowed again because he was 18 years older than I. And I was widowed again after four and a half years of marriage. Well, that was the end of it as far as I was concerned. My mind was totally shut. So when Lars Gren came after me <laughs> in a very southern gentlemanly way, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, patience. My mind was shut. And it was as though the Lord was beginning to say to me when I could see that Lars was closing in for the kill. <laughs> you have not asked me one thing about this. 
That's what God was saying to me. You have not even prayed. How do you know that I don't want you to marry this man? Well, I don't know, Lord. I couldn't imagine that you did, but might you? Well, he did. My marital status is a gift. I am a wife now, and that is a gift. To be received with thanksgiving and offered back to Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what the hardest thing in your life is. Of course I don't. Maybe nobody else does either. Maybe you have something in your life that you cannot speak of to anyone. You would dare not speak of it. That's where the cross has its deep and personal meaning. It means suffering, doesn't it? It means death to myself, perhaps to my dreams, perhaps to my ambitions, perhaps to what I hoped for my children. And that hurts a lot of us. Perhaps something else that I can't even imagine. Someone has written this, everyone offering himself to God must offer the glory of life in himself, whether it be through giving it up or rejoicing in it. Whatever the offering may be, whether it's giving, giving something up or rejoicing in something, or through a renunciation or an embrace, there are certain things in our lives that we have to renounce. We certainly renounce sin in the name of Christ. And it comes back again and again, and we renounce it in the name of Jesus Christ. We relinquish it. Any of you who get my newsletter may have read several years ago when my daughter was expecting number five that I was upset about that, not because I don't like big families. As I told you, I came from a family of six, but I just felt so sorry for my daughter having number five so soon after number four, and she had all she could handle. She was homeschooling two children. She had two preschoolers. And here she was pregnant with number five, and I was very upset. And I wrote about this in my newsletter, just telling how I had to get down on my knees and acknowledge, first of all, that it was absolutely none of my business. (laughs) You know, I wanted to tell my son-in-law, why don't you sleep in the backyard for a while? (laughs) I confess. I mean, this is absurd. It's stupid. I, didn't, I don't think I did say that to him, but I was churning inside when my son-in-law and my daughter came into my bedroom. I was staying in their guest room, and they came in about 5 o'clock in the morning with this announcement. I was not thrilled. I got down on my knees, and I just said, Lord, I know how wrong my attitude is about this thing. You are the author of life. This is my daughter. This is my child. She belongs to you, not me. And so you know my feelings, Lord. Pity, upset, turmoil. I can't handle these feelings. I give them to you, Lord. Now, any feeling that you can't handle, handle, I recommend this simple little gesture. Just get down on your knees, open your hands, and say, Lord, I renounce this in the name of Jesus Christ. And by your grace, I will not retrieve it. It's amazing what that can do. I shared this with a lady who was having almost pathological problems with jealousy over her husband talking to another woman. She said, any time I see my husband in a conversation with some other woman, I can't stand it. She said, I just go bananas, and I have no reason to think that he's ever been unfaithful or ever wants to be. She said, I know it's just stupid. What can I do? So I just told her this little thing. She said, I can't tell you what a difference this made in my life. Acceptance of what God allows. Relinquishment first, acceptance next. No to myself, yes to God. This same author goes on to say, it is not in making our flesh unfeeling that we hallow God's name on earth. Now, when I've spoken about bringing your emotions under control and written about it in my book, Discipline, somebody says to me, well, Mrs. Elliott, I don't understand how you got rid of your emotions. 
And I say, when did I ever say anything about getting rid of them? When you train a child, you're not getting rid of the child. You're bringing the child under authority. When you train a racehorse, you're not getting rid of the horse. You're bringing the racehorse under the authority of those reins. And so I am bringing my emotions under the authority of Jesus Christ. My emotions were out of whack over Valerie's number five. That was not her problem. That was my problem with God. It is not in making our flesh unfeeling that we hallow God's name on earth. And how do we hallow God's name on earth? We pray all the time, hallowed be thy name. And I have to be willing to cooperate with the hallowing of his name. In other words, the making of his name holy. Is it evident in my life? Is it evident in your life that you are a woman who makes God's name appear holy? God's name is holy, of course. We can't do anything to change the fact that his name is holy, but we can certainly do a great deal to change people's perception of his holiness by the way we live. It is not in making our flesh unfeeling. So I come to God with all these seething feelings, my weaknesses, my sins, my failures, my irritating habits that drive my husband up the wall. And there are some. And I pray. And I think the Lord has made some progress with me. I've made some progress. Because I don't want to be irritating to him. But this is what I come to God with. This is what I am. This is the baggage that I come with. It's not that I can get rid of it by myself. Christian had to come to the foot of the cross. And it was at the foot of the cross that the burden rolled off. I get letters asking for advice about all kinds of problems that I know absolutely nothing about. You know, my answer is simple. And I get accused of being simplistic because the answer is simple. Take it to the foot of the cross. I can't tell you what you should do in this or that situation, but I can tell you where you can find out. Bring it to the foot of the cross. Look at it in the light of God's face. It'll look different there. If you have a quarrel with something that the Bible says and says, well, that's impossible in my situation. I can't do that. I can't submit to this husband. I can't stay home and take care of my children. I have to work. There are a whole lot of things that the Bible doesn't cover. I don't know anything. I don't know what to say to a woman in either of those situations. I only know that the Bible tells me that I'm to submit to my husband And the Bible tells me, as an older woman, to teach the younger women to stay home. And so I do my best to stick with what the Bible does say. But this is what comes when you or I come to the foot of the cross. We come not by making our flesh unfeeling, but in offering it to God, burning with the flame of life. Out of my bondage, sorrow, and night... Jesus, I come. Into thy freedom, gladness, and light, Jesus, I come. Out of my sickness, into thy health. Out of my want, and into thy wealth. Out of my sin, and into thyself, Jesus, I come to thee. I offer to God, burning with the flame of life. Everything can be put into the fire that Christ came to kindle. And the Bible says he came to bring fire on the earth. Well, I'm sure that means a great deal more than what this writer tells me, but this writer certainly opened up a new crack in the door so that I could understand a little bit more. Everything can be put into the fire that Christ came to kindle, whether it be the bitter wood of sorrow, the bitter wood of sorrow, or the substance of joy, it will burn upwards with the same splendor of light. In Hebrews 12, we read that we are to make our lives a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. What can make my life holy? I am not holy in myself. How can I bring 
my body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God. It is the sacrifice that sanctifies it. It is the laying of my life on God's altar, on that fire that he came to kindle on earth, that it becomes holy by being offered, as in the Old Testament times, the vessels in the tabernacle. Some were made of gold, some were made of bronze, some of silver. It was the same gold, the same bronze, and the same silver that made other objects in the world, but the ones in the temple, the tabernacle, were called holy. Why? Not because they were made of different material, but because they were offered to God. My work in my kitchen is holy when it's offered to God. My work at my desk is holy because it's offered to God. My work at the ironing board, it's holy work. You mothers of little babies, It's holy work when you breastfeed that baby. It's holy work when you change those diapers. When my little granddaughter Elizabeth, who's now the oldest of the girls, was probably seven or eight, her mother asked her to give a bottle to whoever the baby was then. I've forgotten. (laughs) And I know that baby hadn't had very many bottles. They were all breastfed, but this was an occasion when Valerie said, would you please give this bottle to the baby? And Elizabeth just rolled her eyes, and she looked at me, and she said, oh, Granny, I think I've given him about a million bottles. (laughs) And I said, now, if that was the baby Jesus, might you look at it differently? Well, I guess so. (laughs) It's the offering to Jesus of your life, of your work, of everything that you have, everything that you do, everything that you are, and everything that you suffer, put it on the altar. Let the flames carry it heavenward. Be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Now I brought along another beautiful letter, very different, from a farmer. He said, I don't always get to listen to your program, but your words have comforted and challenged me, who is a sinful creature but longs to be obedient to God. I purchased Stepping Heavenward, which is an old book written a hundred years ago by Elizabeth Prentice, a few months ago, and it has been especially helpful over the last two months. My wife and I were expecting the birth of our first child, and the due date was my birthday, November 15th. David Levi, and he gives the last name, was born July 27th. The due date was November. The baby was born in July. He lived about a half an hour and then went to be with our Creator. My wife, Arletha, and I were teaching first and second grade in Sunday school. The memory work for the summer was Mark 10, 13 to 16. Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God has new and deeper meaning for us now. Two days before David was born, I went down to eat breakfast in the hospital. For reading, I took Stepping Heavenward with me. Arletha and I had been, and still are, reading it aloud together, and opened it to this journal entry. There is so much I could say. This uh, this book, Stepping Heavenward, is the diary of a girl beginning at age 16 and taking her through engagement, marriage, uh, motherhood, death, all sorts of things in her life. And so he's quoting from her book, And really, with so much to make me happy, what would become of me if I had no trials? End of quote. Suffering, endurance, character, hope, which does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Now, that, that letter was written September 12, 1993, He has stapled together three more pages. This one, January 1994. Why have I not written for such a long time? Most of my energy has gone into supporting Arletha and my work. I had hoped we would be farther along in the grieving process by now, but there there are times when it is still quite hard. If someone, and then he stops. Next page, April 11th. It is now April 11th. I am again attempting to complete my letter to you as I started in January but did not get very far. Since January, Arletha has been doing much better. We have gone through a lot of suffering since July, but there has been a lot of growing as well. I still listen to your program when I can. I can still hear, and again he stops. January 21, 1995. 
I look back at my attempts to complete a letter to your ministry and think, don't give up. I do feel as if I withheld a gift from you by not letting you know how your ministry has helped in my walk. My wife and I are expecting our second child in April. That's next month, which means she is 28 weeks along. Without going into details, my prayer request is for a healthy baby, but more so that we can be at peace and trust God completely every day. We have also appreciated reading Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. Sometimes we don't get the point, but it's usually insightful and challenging. <laughs> yes, yeah, so there's some tough things in there. I have much more trouble with the things I can understand than with the things I can't understand. Same with the Bible. Then he says, Is it possible that God knew in his wisdom that I should give my first child to him in order to create a real desire for children and to realize what a blessing they are? Two years ago, I was not very excited about having children. Not because I didn't like them, but because I knew the conflict for me that would come about in the demands for my time. We must be allowed to grieve, but also we need to allow others to be a part of the grieving process, as was told in Stepping Heavenward. Thank you for allowing God to use you and for remaining faithful. I pray for your ministry. I just thought of how a child's preciousness was taught to this father through his death. And the parents accepted that child's death. We can try all kinds of ways of getting over grief. And the world has all sorts of psychological steps to go through. There's a grieving process that I'm told you're supposed to go through. It takes five steps. And it involves things like anger and bargaining, which I don't think a Christian needs to go through. Maybe you'll get through it that way. But I know that when I knew that my husband Jim was missing, God brought to my mind the words from Isaiah 43, When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, for I am the Lord thy God. He wants to teach us that he loves us. And you who are training your little children by spanking them, you have to take that little child in your arms after the spanking and say, Honey, I want you to do I want you to learn that I did this because I love you. Now he's not going to believe that. <laughs> did you believe that when your parents said this hurts me worse than it hurts you? <laughs> of course not. But the time comes when you become a parent and you know it's the absolute truth. And the Bible says that the father who does not discipline his son hates him. The world puts it the other way around, doesn't it? If you spank your child, you hate your child. That's abuse. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Abuse and spanking are two very, very different things. But God has to, in effect, spank us sometimes. C.S. Lewis says he whispers to us in our joys. Very often we're not listening to God when everything's going fine. He whispers to us in our joys. We don't hear him. He speaks to us in our conscience, and he shouts to us in our pain. It's when we're in the bottom of the barrel, when everything seems to have fallen to pieces, that God finally gets our attention. He says, if you suffer with me, you will also reign with me. The cross of Jesus means suffering. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain, free to all, the healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Can you sing those hymns about the cross honestly? That stanza that I was trying to think about in the first talk says, O oh, safe and happy shelter, O oh, refuge tried and sweet, O oh, trysting place where heaven's love and heaven's justice meet, as to the holy patriarch, speaking of Jacob, a wondrous dream was given, so seems my Savior's cross to me, a ladder up to heaven. 
the cross is a safe and happy shelter. Not to be feared, not to be shrunk from, not to be avoided. A safe and happy shelter, a refuge tried and sweet. And this lady, whose letter I read earlier, she was at the end of her rope. There was no solution whatsoever except to come to that trysting place and find the shelter of the cross by saying, Yes, Lord, I'm going to do what you say. Acceptance. Relinquishment of all the bitterness. Acceptance of life, which comes out of death. Paul said, Death worketh in us and life in you. And if you are going to cooperate in Jesus' redemptive work here in the world, you are going to have to be broken bread and poured out wine. Life is going to work in somebody else because death went to work in you. And as one chapel speaker said when I was a college student, and I never forgot it, if your life is broken when given to Jesus, it may be because pieces will feed a multitude when a loaf would satisfy only a little boy. The meaning of the cross, relinquishment and acceptance. No to myself, yes to God. God bless you.